A young man stands by a street corner with a note in his hand, along with a ripped up envelope that was sent to him. Written on it is nothing else but the sentence, meet by the pancake house at noon. I want to see you again. Love, Mark. Welp, this is where I'm supposed to be, at least, the man said to himself. His name was John Edwards, and he was waiting for none other than his brother, Mark, which he had not seen in three years since he moved off in order to live life on his own in Tennessee. They were close as fil- children, but fell estranged, as many siblings do when they have large age differences. The road was barren, and he looked both ways down the straight country path for any type of autom- automobile, but it was silent in both directions. <sighs> he glanced at the front of the pancake house in order to read their clock. It read 12.05. He sighed and sat down on the sidewalk. All of a sudden, a distant roar of an engine becomes more and more apparent. He sees a bright yellow Camaro thundering down the road, leaving a giant cloud of dirt in its wake. John jolts up from his seat, eagerly awaits the car, which he assumes to be his brother due to the speed. John and Mark both grew up in a very small town with a population of only 500, and due to its quiet nature, he guessed if anyone was driving that recklessly, it must be his brother. The car screeched to his halt, and he heard a familiar voice yell from inside it. Get in. My bad for being late, by the way. Was held up at work and didn't get much sleep, Mark explained from within the car. Wasn't really surprised anyways, John replied smart, snarkily. Haven't seen you in ages. How's it been, little bro? said Mark. They then hugged and exchanged greetings before the car lurched into action. So, what have you been up to? said Mark. What have I been up to? Why would you want to know that? I haven't seen you in years. I want to hear about you first. Well, I've been working up at the lumber mill where I live and making my earnings through that. Besides going to work, all I really do is fish. Mark said while promptly chuckling to himself. So you don't wrestle anymore? What's up with that? I thought you were going to university to wrestle. Well, uh, about that, Mark swallowed nervously and then continued. Things don't always turn out like they think they will, John. And university just wasn't the thing for me. Whatever you do, just don't tell Mom and Pop. They'll kill me. John held back his frustration and finally replied, Well, if I guess... Well, I guess if you're making a healthy living, I can't really be all that mad at you. They both looked onward at the ever-expanding road and increased their speed ever so slightly. Do you still wrestle? Mark asked. <laughs> Do you still wrestle? Are you even listening to yourself? Of course I still wrestle. I'm the best that's ever come through my high school in ages. Then what's this I hear about from Mom about you not being able to get on the wrestling team last year? Mark replied. John express- John's expression immediately soured, for he knew who was going to talk about his least favorite subject. Oh, that's, uh, just, you know, grades. I didn't make grades last year, and they had to kick me off the team. Come on, I know you're better than that. I know how smart you've always been, and you just need to apply yourself, that's all. I believe in you. You just have to st- st- put some work in like you do with your sports, Mark wi- wisely said. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that one. I've heard it a thousand times. I'm trying to work at the Johnson's Farm anyways. I've been working there for two years now, and I get a decent pay. You're still working at the Johnson's? How are they doing? The conversation went back and forth like this for hours, and the drive was long, and they had nothing but time to spare. The brothers enjoyed catching up on time they'd spent away from each other. For the first time in a while, they were truly having a connection. John eventually drifted to sleep, and Mark didn't disturb him, since he knew he could use the rest. Rise and shine, Mark yelled. John immediately jolted away, cutting his head on the ceiling of the car. Ow, not funny, man, Mark exclaimed angrily. It was now dark, and it was seemed very late. Sorry, it's just that we're almost here, that's all. I had to wake you up at some point, Mark replied. John wiped the crust away from his eyes and gazed upon a whole new landscape. There were large pine trees all around and a puffy billowing like gray clouds overhead. He sat there a while, soaking in. We're just about there, said Mark as he drove further up the mountain. Up ahead was a basic country house, stilted up slightly for flooding, and what could have been more than three rooms. That wasn't the great part about his estate, however, for directly to the right of his house stood a vast expanse of lake at the top of the plateau. It had to be at least five miles across. across. Wow, I've really never really seen anything like it. 
I can see why you're really fine with this place now, John replied. <laughs> yep, nothing beats sitting up here on my porch during the summer. That is unless we're including fishing. In fact, I barely had to pay for my own food since it ain't really hard to catch salmon on the lake. That's actually the reason I took you out here. Really? John replied in a confused tone. I thought it was just to reconnect. Yeah. And what way is better to reconnect than catching a few fish and just talking to your favorite brother? Let's get some rest. And we can head out in the morning. And with not a word more, they did just that. Both exhausted from the long ride, they stomped from the car into the cabin and promptly fell asleep, eager for the day ahead of them. In the morning, they gathered fishing supplies, bait, lures, fishing line, anything you could possibly think of was accounted for. Here, you can borrow my old, old rod, Mark said, handing John his spare fishing pole. Where are we going fishing exactly, asked John. Mark just pointed onward to a crude dock with a shabby rowboat tethered to it. That piece of junk? Are you serious, John bickered? What are you calling a piece of junk? My boat is perfectly fine as long as you can get past the soreness of rowing. Last one there is to bait the hook, hooks, Mark, Mark belted out, while simultaneously getting an unfair head start. Half an hour later, they were calmly drifting along the water, fishing lines in, just looking up at the sky and chat chatting. They did this for what seemed like forever. So, does it always take this long to catch a fish, John asked. Sometimes it can go a whole day without a bite, Mark replied, not even caring to lift his head in order to address him. And just like that, with perfect meeting timing, John's line started untwining at an alarming rate. Grab it, grab it, you have a bite, Mark yelled. John sprung into action and grabbed the line with his mangly fingers, which had been broken many times over due to wrestling, and started reeling in the fish. It must be a big one, it's pretty strong, yelled John. But after what must have been a five minute battle, he threw the fish out of the water and into the boat. It was what had to be over a two foot salmon. Whoa, what a great catch, Mark replied, inspecting the fish over closer. Now if we want to catch any more, we have to row over to a new part of the lake, since all the fish over here are spooked. Just as Mark said that, he noticed one of the oars must have floated off in the commotion and gone away from the boat. Him and John started scanning the area for, for it and saw it about ten feet out, floating calmly along the water. I'll get it, Mark exclaimed as he dove into the water too quickly for John to say otherwise. This, however, is something that was well within the ability of someone like Mark who was athletic and had no known health problems. But as Mark was swimming back, something on it happened happened his freestyle stroke abru abruptly turned to thrashes in the water and a symphony of gurgles accompanied his panic you okay asked john noting his brother was no longer swimming mark his body was now si sinking below the surface and john dove into the water in order to try to save his brother he swam deeper and deeper until he thought his ears were about to explode from the pressure he was able to get a hold and drag him back up to the boat, but when he went to check his pulse, it was no longer there. John didn't say a word, and rather he just sat there with his brother's body soaking in what had happened. He may have endured, endured great physical pains in his life, but nothing quite the magnitude of losing a loved one had occurred before now. What happened, he thought to himself. There was not even a sign of injury on him. He just stopped all of a sudden for no reason. There was not a single sound of river bugs, and he sat there for a while just soaking in the experience. John then amateur, amateurishly paddled the boat back to shore with one oar and called the police. He immediately rang up his parents and arranged for him to be picked up. It's okay, son. They say it was a heart attack. He had an oversized heart none of us knew about. There was nothing we could have done, his father would explain to him. But the event kept playing over in his brain. There was nothing he could do now but honor the memory of his brother, and from this point onward, he was determined to do what his brother never could do and wrestle for him at university. What was going to be a fun outing with his brother became the most tragic and life-changing event in his life, but he was not going to let it get into him. John would go on to be a nationally ranked college wrestler. The End <laughs>